Aloha and welcome to Human Rights 72nd Anniversary. In 1948, the Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed and created by the General Assembly. At that point, my late husband was just an intern. Robert Mueller was an intern at the United Nations, and he stood there when Eleanor Roosevelt came out of the room and said, it passed. And my husband jumped for joy because he knew what this Universal Declaration of Human Rights meant to all of us. And the newspaper man standing next to him said, oh, throw it in the trash. It's never going to amount to anything. And my husband, Robert Mueller, said, mark my words. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights will last longer than you. And it is now in the Guinness Book of World Records. Why? It's the most translated language and declaration on the planet. So there you go. That newspaper person didn't have their act together, but my husband did. He, tried, he retired 40 years later as the Assistant Secretary General. So that's my history. But I really began working with human rights way before that. When I was three years old, my grandfather told me, who had just immigrated when he was 17, to the United States to avoid World War I. And he said, Barbara, you're going to be a peacemaker. And I said, what? I'm going to be a peacemaker? I'm only three years old. Oh, but you have your whole life ahead of you to be a peacemaker. Lo and behold, I find Robert Mueller, a bigger peacemaker than me. We get married and the rest is history. Long story short, what a great day to welcome you. You know, I was reading this fabulous book that Debbie gave me, and it says the story of human rights. In the preamble, it says, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, peace for our planet and the world. So today I want to welcome you all. And I want to welcome Nancy, who brought Joshua to our attention. She is serving on a committee that is working on human rights. And so why don't I invite you, Nancy Martin, who is our program director and education director for the United Nations Association, to introduce Joshua and we will begin. Thank you all for joining us. All right, Nancy. Okay, it's my privilege and honor, it's a great honor, Joshua, to introduce um, Joshua. He's an advocate, he's a teacher, He's, oh, and I should say esteemed teacher, and he's an activist, all rolled into one. So I think that's unusual because teachers, you know, they always say we shouldn't be activists or we have to be careful. So um, I value that greatly in Joshua. And he's taught all over. He teaches at the University of Hawaii, but also he's taught many workshops and um many courses, um, there's a huge number, huh, on human rights. So human rights is his specialty. And he's also worked with indigenous Tibetans. He knows everything we need to know. And he participated in um, the Human Rights Council um, Review of the United States, which I think we have that saying, um, think globally and act locally. So I think it's a good thing for us to know what the United States, you know, how we measure up with human rights. And lately I felt like it's a disaster. We haven't done very well, but what we should do is learn. So um, Joshua, is there anything else you want to say to introduce yourself? Oh no, that's more than enough. Okay. Thank you. Take it away. All right. Well, aloha. We're ready. Aloha. And it's an honor and a welcome. And thank you for such a gracious uh, introduction. Uh, my heart is full of gratitude. And I'm ready to begin sharing. And, and let's think of it as a dialogue. Please think of it that way. And I'm very open to answering any questions or talking about anything you want. Uh, just getting back to uh, Barbara's beginning, though, I, I really want to say it's exciting because I remember when I first started teaching human rights, uh, and I first started teaching at the University of Hawaii, uh, when they did the survey, it was said that 7% uh, of the people have heard of the UDHR. 
And uh, now they like, oh, Josh, it's so good. It's almost 20%. And deep down, it's not that good because that means I'm only touching 1% a year. So we got to do a little bit more advocacy and a little bit more human rights education as well. But the other important point that uh, Barbara was sharing uh, that also inspired me was the UDHR in itself. Uh, I'm fortunate to um, be the executive director of the Hawaii Institute for Human Rights that I started with uh, a dozen students in the first course I taught uh, with the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. And it was an exciting semester in the sense that uh, our idea was let's apply everything at the international level to our islands and see what's possible and what we can do with it. And one of the first actions we did was take the UDHR and uh, translate it into Olelo Hawaii. And uh, when I turned that in, it was one of the most exciting days because it was the next time I went to Geneva. Then I would only go to Geneva during the summer times. I teach way too many courses, up to seven classes at the University of Hawaii, and then just leave in the summers and go the entire time and attend as many UN human rights meetings as possible in Geneva. And now I think I have a much better balance where I teach two to three classes and then leave after class on Monday or Tuesday and then do my best to do all my projects. Uh, definitely, I just have been started working with Tibet last year, meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala, and now assisting the, um, their mission in Geneva, supporting the parliament in exile, but assisting the Tibetan government in exile at the, um, at the UN bodies in Geneva. And it was so cool to turn in the Hawaii version of the UDHR. And they just told me it was um, one of the officers at the OHCHR said, oh my gosh, this is amazing because we were just a couple short for getting the Guinness Book of World Records. So this is an important one. So I think it's exciting to one, indigenize the UDHR and uh, two, that it's, it's the most translated document in the world. So, so it is exciting. And um, talking about indigenous, I was also just on a meeting this morning uh, with Edith Ballantyne, since you brought up the aspect of my indigenous rights work. And Edith Ballantyne used to work for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And she was the NGO during the first decade ever against racism, inviting indigenous peoples in 1977. So it's amazing because it's actually her birthday today and she's 99. And she couldn't look a day over 66. <laughs> but uh, she was pretty amazing uh, talking yesterday for over an hour about what inspired her to first host that event in 1977 and what it was like then in 81 and then the UN Working Group on Indigenous Peoples being created in 1982. So what I think is important and what's essential about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and human rights in general is we all have a story to share and we all have something to contribute. And it's finding really what your passion is and how you can participate. And that's the most important part of it. And everyone can be an activist. So it, it's very exciting to speak today. And I definitely have to admit, uh, when I started in my human rights advocacy, it was you know the typical steps that many of us do, uh, Amnesty International, uh, doing the work to free prisoners of conscience. And when you heard that story, that you know some students were just toasting to freedom. And a young man at that time was sitting in his kitchen in London and uh, he complained to his mom, mom, can you believe someone got arrested? That she said, what are you gonna do, complain about it or do something about it? And then that individual who was the founder, of course, of uh, Amnesty International started the letter writing campaign. So he was a Quaker living at home with mom, found people getting uh, arrested for just toasting to freedom. And, and then that with the Quaker belief of helping everyone. Uh, Mr. Bennett said, everyone came together. And now we know Amnesty International because of course all of its concerts. And the other range, right? Since you guys are a pretty wild, fun bunch. Think about um, Beastie Boys, right? The Beastie Boys started out with songs like you have to fight for your right, not to save the world, but to party. And then in the end, Adam Yauk is there organizing Tibetan freedom concerts. So the exciting part is, it's a universal language. It's something that we all care. Some of us just are more fortunate to find our voice in that process than others, but it's never too late. And it's exciting, especially after being on the phone with Edith. Now I know I have at least 50 more years of doing this exciting work. So I'm even more rejuvenated. And I think as uh, was brought up by Barbara that 
journalists, unfortunately, can be a little cynical. I have fortunately majored in political science and journalism and peace studies. So it's either I was going to make the news or write the news. But uh, yeah, journalists sometimes are too cynical. But I really realized you can make the news and write the news and do whatever the world needs. So it's sort of a good combination of that. And that's been a phenomenal meeting of uh, my passion so far. I, I am fortunate that I am an academic. I kind of consider myself an accidental academic, though. I went to Maui one day, here today, gone to Maui, as they say, but I went to Maui one day, and uh, it was, I was an activist. I was a student on the Board of Regents, so I was going to a meeting to say education is a human right and stop raising our tuition, and I saw a flyer, and it said, uh, job listing, lecture, political science, and I was like, hmm, teacher, I've been too busy with graduate school so far that all I was doing was normally activism. So I never thought of a TA ship where you only get to sit there and then when the teacher leaves, then you get to go that day and speak. So I was like, hmm. And um, so I ran to the library. It's when you had little discs, put in the disc, printed out a resume, and then turned it in. And on a funky, crazy way, end up having five interviews that day. Uh, they would just keep bringing in different professors. And you know, it was my first real decent job interview, and I haven't had any since then. I've never, I'm working on a resume now, though, thanks to COVID. It gives me a little bit more time, but I've never had to worry about a resume. And the exciting thing was, so I interviewed five times, and it was a great experience. I loved it because everybody asked cool questions from all these different history and economics and, uh, you know, all those aspects of all the different teachers there. And uh, in the end, they said, okay, it's three things. One, you're the youngest. And I'm like, Okay, youngest isn't bad. They're like, yeah, by two decades, by some standards. And I'm like, oh, cool, I'm the youngest, woohoo. Second one, totally humbling as it happens in life. You are the least qualified. You have the least experience of teaching. I was like, sweet, right on, back to, back to ground zero. All right, who knows what's going to come. But they said three, they said, but you know the material better than anyone that we've ever interviewed, even like, we can't, even the wife's, the mayor of the wife and a couple other people applied. So it's a small island. I said, okay, so I think that's good, right? That's two out of three. And they said, yes, you have the job, but we also know you're an activist and everybody knows you as an activist on TV. Not one that you play on TV, but you really are an activist. So they said, please don't tell anyone and just show up on January. And I was like, so either I really got hired or they're really messing with me. You know, it was the first version of Punked before it even came out. So that night I went out to celebrate a little because I was on Maui with a bunch of friends and I went out to a very fancy hotel and I was like just in the club a little like, I'm a professor, I'm gonna teach, this is great. You know, I was all excited, especially since I didn't plan it that morning when I went to Maui. And uh, Whitney Houston was there. And I was like, get out, it's Whitney Houston, this is great. So um, as the night went on, we kind of looked at each other across the room and then I just went up to her and I was like, guess what? I just got hired as a teacher and I can't tell anybody, but I'm pretty sure you won't tell anybody either because no one will believe we're talking. And we ended up having a great night, end up dancing. I was like, is Bobby anywhere? Because I didn't want to get beat down or anything like that. We had a great time dancing. And the next night I was at the Hard Rock with all of my student activist friends and we're all happy that we we're able to keep a tuition down. And uh, Whitney Houston comes in and says, Aloha, Josh, how are you? And I'm like, Aloha, Whitney. And it was great because I didn't ask her for anything when I first met her, but I got a really good um, autograph from my grandma that said, uh, love and peace, Whitney, since you guys gave peace awards. I thought I'd share this story. And it was, uh, and it said, love grandma, da, 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 da. So it was the coolest little napkin ever. And uh, we used to always sing that, I will always love you song. You know, the one where you pass out before you get to the, I, ah, yeah. <laughs> but I can sing that one, right? So that was my first day as an academic. Uh, and within three weeks, unfortunately, I got in trouble. The owner of Shell Gas Station called the university to complain that I was doing bad things. And I didn't even know what I did, but I remembered chapter three was political activism. So I mentioned Shell Oil briefly. But fortunately now, 20 years later, I've been teaching at UH the entire time. Uh, I'm also very fortunate that I teach at the International Training Center for Teaching Peace and Human Rights in Geneva, Switzerland. And I also teach for the University of New South Wales Diplomacy Training Program, mainly with indigenous peoples in Asia Pacific. And then also in Vienna at the International Human and People's Rights uh, Program. So I'm very fortunate that I do get to teach everywhere and I love teaching. It definitely became a passion, 
and almost distracted me from all my advocacy, but I've been able to balance both. And I think, as Nancy was saying it, instead of burning out, I've just burned brighter. Because if you ever get too exhausted of advocacy, you know, we always have to respond and whew, I think we can all take a moment and have a drink. Looking back at our, now talking about our former president and the former administration, uh, those were hard times, right? Those were four years where, oh my goodness, we were constantly having to respond and put out fires and try to bring some sanity to a country that helped create the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was really losing its way, forgetting its moral compass. And you almost were looking for the bar about where it was because it just kept falling so low, you couldn't believe it was our country. It was worse than many of the countries that I'm flown to to go help around the world to work on their human rights issues. So it's been a tough four years and I'll get to the UPR towards the end of the talk. But yeah, you know, these human rights, these standards are very important. It's important that we live up to those. And we've been responding so much. And so when you respond, many people get exhausted because you're just trying to fight and demand a better world. But the cool thing then about teaching is in teaching, you get a lot of reflection. You get to read and you get to share and talk to students and meet with students all the time. And uh, the exciting part about teaching then is it allows you to take a step back. And then when you have another activism thing come up, you're like, I'm ready because I've been reading that. Or I just found that or I was in Sabah, Malaysia, stopping a dam from being built. So we can apply this here. So I think the two go really well. So just like they told you, Barbara, that we're not supposed to get involved and do things. You know, the truth is you really should do what your heart tells you to and then do as much as you can with others. And I really believe this, the more you give, the more you get, but more importantly, the more we all help each other, sort of that Rage Against the Machine song, everything for everyone and nothing for ourselves, we always have enough. And it, you know, it's that season, it's my favorite season. Now everybody's talking about peace and joy and love. And I'm like, welcome to my season but it's too commodified and commercialized. But for me, this is exactly how I always feel and what I enjoy. It's a time I get to spend more time at home. Of course, this year I've got to spend a lot of time at home. It's been great. I woke up in the same bed longer and more than I ever have in 20 years. Because when I started teaching, I lived on Maui. So I had to go Monday through Wednesday to Maui and then fly home, come back to see mom and granny Thursday through Sunday. So for 20 plus years, I've never been in my own bed, but it's amazing. So I'm really worried about the world because I'm very relaxed and more charged than I've ever been. Like my battery's full and I've been never been able to reflect so much. So when we get out there and we all get our vaccines like uh, William Shakespeare did yesterday, we'll be able to uh, even do more because I've never had more time to think about what's wrong. But more importantly, connect with quality people like yourselves using the technology to then hopefully create a transformative world that we can uh, continue to build together up until we get to Edith's 1999th birthday. So we'll meet again for that one. And so um, it, it's been exciting to teach and the advocacy has been great as well. I always see my advocacy is usually, um, like I said earlier about not having that resume or, or business card, it would be fun. Um, I never thought of it, but when I first went to the UN in 1997, I had done MUN, I did UNA and all that. But when I went, I got one problem. My feet are size 12 or 13. So if you take clothes and dress up every day, that's your whole suitcase. It's just those shoes and maybe one suit. And then I didn't give me enough to be able to bring back all the chocolate. And in my case, you can tell some books from Geneva that I really wanted to know. So I decided after the first year, the first year was great. I went in 97 in the summer, got to see everything. It was very exhilarating. But I was like, I can't go and take a suit. It makes no sense. I'm gonna just wear my Aloha shirt because that's where I wear when I lobby and meet with the governor or anyone or my senators. And it's just how we live in Hawaii. So, and then I can bring shoes that are more comfortable and I can wear them to go out plus go to work and it turned out great. And so uh, the coolest thing now though, I didn't realize it at the time, but Jose Ramos Horta, he was uh, one of the first big Nobel Peace Prize leaders that I met because we hosted him here in Hawaii when I was a student. He always wore a bow tie and he always had a little bit of stubble. He's kind of a good looking guy. So he always you know, enjoyed the little stubble look. He was easy on the eyes. But then everyone could identify him by the bow tie and the stubble. I wasn't as savvy as him. Mine was just purely practical as I explained to being more comfortable and being able to put more of my luggage, really more paper and books to bring home. 
And so now when I'm at the UN, people walk up to me and they say, you're Josh Cooper. They just walk up to me because they see a flowered shirt. And they say, oh, my friend said you could help us and this is what happened to us and what can we do? So it's the greatest compliment because then you'll have people coming up, the Maasai from Kenya, uh, people, even I promise some of you might not even have heard of the Zo people of Northern India. My favorite ones, that was uh, last year in 2019, the Kuki. And I was like, oh, we got to change that name because people are going to think you're crazy, right? You're like Kuki. And it's not the cookie like with milk that we all enjoy eating as well. It's K-U-K-I. And they never surrendered to the British. Uh, they're absolutely brilliant, amazing indigenous peoples. And what, when the British burned their food, they walked up to them and said, uh, we're not going to fight you because you just took all of our food. But once we grow our crops and we have our food again, we'll continue fighting because we'll never, of course, cede our sovereignty to you because this is our homeland. But yeah, that guy, also amazing, over 90 years old went to New York because he said, someone said he had to meet me. He's like, can we meet tonight? And I'm like, this is crazy, but yes, whatever you want. You're over 90 and you want me to help you, whatever you want. So good news is that allowed me to really learn all the parts of the UN and how to participate. I have to say it's an honor that different people have approached me and then it taught me new things. So Aboriginals from Australia came up about a land rights case. So I learned and remembered about the early warning urgent action mechanism under CERD, the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And then within a year, it was front page headline news, Australia found guilty of racism under international law. And so that was exciting because that was just taking something I had studied or heard about and then applying it. And I think that's what we can all do is really see what's wrong in the world and then see what we can do. And more importantly, it's also about what we want. And I think that's one of the best parts about the UPR is it's what's wrong, but it's also, we know because we're living it, what we want the most and what has to change in those different aspects. So it's been an exciting time doing advocacy at the uh, international and national level. It's um, most recently, I've been working a lot with human rights cities, and that's been fascinating to localize uh, the global agenda and bringing it down from the international to the island perspective. But uh, Hawaii became the first state of human rights. And we just did a resolution at the state legislature uh, a couple years back. And then we then focused on Human Rights Day. Not today, because I applaud so many of you coming together to talk on Human Rights Day. For me, for a while, Human Rights Day was really tough to celebrate in America, right? Because People really do eat all that turkey on Thanksgiving, then go out for Black Friday and buy more things than they need, trying to find the love that they hope for, and then forgetting to spend the time with the people they love. And most people are in sort of a coma or a crazy frenzy, probably through New Year's until Martin Luther King Day, where everybody wakes up and with I Have a Dream Day. So December 10th, that you can get so many people together, shows me why I want to participate and partner more with Santa Barbara. You guys are great. And so celebrate our human rights day around women's day on march 8th because that's when our legislature is in session and that's also when students are in class and do all those things so you're much more amazing than any things i've done in hawaii because you actually could pull it off in december and so this is really great and uh, the human rights city movement is growing that it's exciting that dc was the first city that was declared it's just celebrated its decade of being a human rights city uh, there's a U.S. Human Rights City Alliance. So we've taken all the international instruments that our government is too arrogant or exceptional to uh, ratify. And we've ratified those at the state level and the city level. Also, though, it's exciting to see the global movement of human rights cities. They first started in Argentina. In Argentina, uh, they were, of course, trying to heal the nation after the dirty war. In Rosario, Argentina, said, we will be a human rights city. And they then created this concept of we will implement human rights, where, as Eleanor Roosevelt says, where they begin at home. Another exciting one that I like to share is in Korea. There's an amazing city called Gwangju. And Gwangju, uh, they were struggling for democracy. And it was when they had a more uh, dictatorial regime. And the people of Gwangju thought, we are fighting and standing up for democracy, and America will come to our rescue. They were, of course, very sad that we didn't, but that city hosts a human rights meeting for human rights cities, and they just celebrated the 10th anniversary of their annual meeting. 
And it's exciting because they have a subway. The subway stop is a human rights stop. So it's such a cool idea, right? And that's the idea is we can do popular education about human rights so it's more accessible to everyone. Uh, they have cool signs on all the buses, but the human rights city metro stop, that subway stop in Guangzhou has books for kids to read, has videos playing, has posters of all the Nobel Peace Prize laureates. And it's just so dynamic that we really can, in a way, take rights and bring them to everyday people everywhere in our community that we just don't think of. And so for the human rights city's approach, I've enjoyed it a lot. I've had a really good time uh, thinking about it and exploring. Uh, we've come up with cool things to do that. Uh, one idea was one that came out from Samantha Power when she was at the UN as our ambassador, when we could be proud. And Sam Power made this amazing LGBTQI um, crosswalk with a rainbow when you walked across First Avenue to the UN. And you know, we could easily just paint every crosswalk near City Hall, and that would be a cool human rights city action. So the idea with human rights cities is just sharing ideas, and I think we have a couple cool ones. Let me see if, I don't know if I've still got it on. I might. Let's see, because I've got really cool events. I will have to look for it, but I think I can pull it up. Can you give me a moment? Uh, we've actually taken the sustainable development goals. So on an exciting front, and I'll just say a couple more things and then pause for just talking together and getting to know each other. Um, we took the sustainable development goals and you know, SDGs, it sounds like something you don't want to catch from a cool party, right? It's a bad thing. And, but we made it popular in the sense that we localized them. So we have local logos of the sustainable development goals. We've taken all of the 17 cubes, but made them more local. And then we also indigenize them and translate them into Olelo Hawaii. And we did the first ever, a voluntary local review. And the voluntary local review was all four islands, o Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and Hawaii Island. And we, we went to the UN um, high level political forum in the summer, and we did a VLR, voluntary local review lab, for an hour and a half. Not one of those small little VNR reviews. Uh, like the UPR, the SDGs has a review process. It's called the voluntary national review of VNR, and they're only 30 minutes long which is sort of never gonna make it. If you have 17 goals and you spend 30 minutes to review them, it's not quite a thorough review. And the UPR, of course, that we talk about is a little better, that's three and a half hour. I consider the UPR sort of like a human rights checkup. How am I doing? How's my blood? Is my bicep pumping? Is everything going good? It's testing to see how the body politic is. And the UPR for us was exciting, but the VLR was so cool because we did that at the high level political forum with this lab reviewing for an hour and a half Hawaii. But then at the General Assembly, we did our official VLR and participated with other cities around the world who are also taking the SDGs and localizing them. So one of the exciting things I would say before I conclude with the UPR is the Paris Agreement. Hawaii was the first state to say we are still in. And every year when I'm teaching a class in the spring, we write legislation and then go down and lobby and try to get it adopted. And Paris Agreement was one, the Convention on the Rights of the Child's another, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, CEDAW. Uh, we just uh, adopted the Aarhus Convention, but also the SDGs. But the Paris Agreement, we were the first state to say, we are still in. So we celebrated our fourth anniversary of we're still in uh, this year and nationally determined contributions. We probably all need to see what each city's doing. So we need to do a locally determined contribution and figure that out to see how we're doing with carbon. So we need to decarbonize, we need to decolonize, we need to decentralize. And that's the exciting part is what each campus and each uh, community chapter can do with UNA. And the UPR, um, I call it the gateway drug to human rights because it includes everything. When a UPR review is happening, it's anything in the UN charter, which of course was drafted in San Francisco, Anything that the country's ratified, which isn't so much for America, we've only ratified three of the nine. Very embarrassing. Hard to go teach around the world when those statistics are that low. Uh, anything a special rapporteur has said. So we all know in 2018, the special rapporteur on extreme poverty came to visit and we hosted and took them all around uh, 
the country to uh, see what's going on on poverty and anything that was uh, mentioned by a UN agency. And that's important because all Americans only know about UNICEF with trick-or-treating. So it's anything any agency said, but also humanitarian law. And that's important because we are too often uh, in too many countries around the world on military points. So uh, it's sort of exciting to be able to uh, see that. And it's exciting to be able to share with you. But our UPR, we just do five steps. Preparation, interaction, consideration. We're about to go to the adoption phase and then implementation. So we've done pretty good so far. Uh, for preparation, it's all about education, telling everybody about their rights, what the UPR is, what it is not, and how to participate. Uh, then we write a five-page report or a 10-page one if we do a shadow one. And UNA, it's been exciting to participate. Uh, worked with Ryan Kaminsky, and we were able to get many chapters to write their own report on themes. So we did that, and then last year, Woo, it's only a year ago, but we were in DC together and I was able to give like a brief keynote opening and then we had five consultations on LGBTQIA, racism, many issues. So that was exciting to get everybody's input. And then during this interaction phase, the interaction phase is sort of exciting because for interaction, you have to convince governments because during the actual UPR and the consideration phase, the third phase, we don't get to speak. On another point, we get to relax and see how successful we were. So in the interaction phase, you've got to connect with the embassies in Washington, D.C. or the missions in Geneva, New York, and share with them what we care about. Because they're really good countries and they want to be champions of certain issues, but they don't know what's going on on the ground. But we do. All your, as we know in political science, you know your political views in three ways. Either rational thought, I read the book, I watched the movie, therefore I think, or intuition. In Hawaiian, it's called your na'au or your gut. I just sense it, Josh. I feel it. I can't tell you why. It's just the way I feel. You know, it's what I believe. And the last one, of course, is personal experiences, which everyone comes to. And so we have all that, and we know what recommendations we need. So in that interaction phase, we share and give the issue we want a country to look at, the question we want them to ask our government, and most importantly, the recommendation we know needs to be put in as a national policy. And so for that, it's been exciting, somewhat challenging since it's COVID. Uh, my last experience of traveling was actually to Washington DC in New York at the end of February. We did an amazing uh, UPR consultations with embassies in DC and then with Rachel and with UNA at their headquarters in the Ford Foundation on the 28th of February. And we're able to meet with them and share these are the issues Americans care about. And we had over nearly three dozen civil society sharing what the most important issues are and having one to two pages to give to governments. Um, since then, that of course was extremely interrupted uh, with COVID. I was able to make it to Samoa though, on March 1st through 8th, I just decided to give it a go. And I was advising attorney generals and heads of state about the CRC because they had their first meeting outside of Geneva. And those experts were then reviewing four Pacific Island countries. So they took the CRC to the community. And one last thing that was so amazing about it, the kids weren't token included. They were really, they were center, which is what rights-based approach is. They moderated panels. Over a hundred students attended all the sessions. And then we had a Talanoa tent. Talanoa is sort of Fijian. Uh, for our dialogue and they actually chaired and spoke on panels on climate justice, corporal punishment, things that were going on in their community. And it was the best week. It was actually my last week of normalcy uh, and, and doing exciting things. But the UPR part, getting back to that, what's exciting is we did cool things remotely. So um, I worked with London Bell, uh, with Bettina Hausman. She's a very close neighbor to you guys. Mm -hmm. And we did something called uh, Serpentine Sessions Virtuel. And so the Serpentine is this cool cafe underneath uh, the Human Rights Council meeting room. And that's normally where you go up to a government, you sort of ask them on a little diplomacy date, and then you share with them the information. And we couldn't, of course, go to Geneva, and we couldn't invite them for Moven Pick ice cream, one of my little favorites. I like it more than coffee. And so what we could do, though, was we created a virtual session 
and it would be fun. I would, um, we'd have to get up at four in the morning though, cause that was their afternoon. And then we would, um, I'd put pictures up on share screen. I would share screen and then we'd be like, welcome to the serpentine. And we have pictures of Mont Blanc and like we're in the serpentine session and they, they all laughed. So it was, you know, it just made them giggle or like, it's so good to meet you. And we would then present for a half an hour what our recommendations were. And the exciting thing is during the UPR review, we got record number 349 recommendations. And most of them can be traced to our recommendations that we as civil society drafted. And so that just happened. And where we're at now is there'll be an adoption. The adoption will be at the Human Rights Council session in February and March. So what we can do and what I'm thinking about is I was gonna hold up because it's the holiday season, but you guys are so ambitious, it's great. But January 6th, we're gonna launch it on the Four Freedoms anniversary speech of Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want and fear, and have a six week campaign leading up to the adoption in Geneva. And it's exciting because now we have a Biden-Harris administration. Will they show up to the Human Rights Council with good speakers? Will they bring a high level person? Will John Kerry go as the climate envoy since we got recommendations on climate change? Will Secretary of State go? Will the US ambassador to the UN go? She's cool, right? She doesn't talk about gunboat diplomacy, but gumbo diplomacy because she's from the South. So, you know, we'll get to put all those juicy justice issues in a pot and stir them up and then see what we get to gobble as we're all hungry for human rights. So that review will happen on in end of February, early March. So the first week on January, we're going to do the first campaign to say, accept my recommendation. It'll be a little hashtag and we can share it, but it's accept my recommendation. And what we can do, Santa Barbara, Honolulu, we go and talk to our city council and our mayors and say, do you know the UPR happened? And they'll be like, no clue. You know, the same look we get when we say it's human rights day. And everybody's like, what? Except for us, you know, it's a small language we speak, but it's a chance to reach out. So we talk about the UPR, ask them if they'll accept the recommendations. We worked with Columbia University and their Human Rights Institute at the law school. And we got many mayors and city councils to sign a document saying we will implement these recommendations locally. Uh, the next week, it gets into Martin Luther King's birthday. It's a great time that we're gonna reach out to our governors and our attorney generals and say, will you recognize these recommendations? Then the week after that, we'll reach out to Congress, ask our congressional delegation, would you hold a hearing? Would you have discussions about these recommendations? Because they're very important, right? It's a good chance to reach out and meet our new ones or reconnect with our older ones. And then the next one is the new cabinet, people at HUD, Housing Urban Development, Health and Human Services, many of these recommendations are under those bodies. Ask them if you know about these recommendations and can you implement them to, of course, do your job better. And then, of course, the final one will be in February, probably around Valentine's Day, because, you know, we all love human rights and liberty and human rights. Um, it'll be uh, lobbying the Biden-Harris administration to make sure that they take these recommendations serious. And one recommendation is a national human rights institution. We're one of the only countries that haven't adopted the Paris principles that agrees that we should have a national human rights institution. And the problem that I can tell by what Pamela is nodding, as well as Barbara, the sad part is when we get recommendations like the UPR, this is our third time. And when we get recommendations from the treaty body like CERD or the Convention Against Torture, the CAT, very similar to my small little dog over there. But, um, and, and the Human Rights Committee, we don't keep them in one place and work on implementing. They go to the State Department and the Department of Justice might look at it, but we need a national human rights institution in the United States. So those are some of the things that we'll look at. And hopefully that uh, covered a lot of issues that looking oh, at- Oh boy, I tried I'm so to glad we recorded this. I'm gonna flow chart it. It's like getting the man on the moon. My first husband had to do that and he put stickies all over the wall of everything they had to do. And I feel like that's what I'm finding myself doing. I'm gonna flow chart you, my young man. I mean, you are a ball of energy and that's what the Human Rights Declaration needed. And Eleanor Roosevelt was also a ball of energy. In fact, she loved to square dance. I knew a lot about her because she was a very good friend of my late husband. And you know, when you think about it, 
you think about, you have to be a whole human being in order to really appreciate the human rights. You have to be living your life so that you can bring that input into the world. But I loved one thing you said. You said, go to your city council and, and ask them, are you aware that this is a possibility that we could actually have a city alliance with the human rights? Come on, get yeah. with it. I love it. Nancy's always wanting us to do it, but Nancy, I think I'm going to agree with you now. Okay, we're opening it up for questions. How do yeah. your students feel when they meet you? Are they pretty jazzed that you're in your class? I think I enjoy, I, I really enjoy, uh, I've been up since 4 a.m. today because I've been teaching in Barcelona. I teach in Barcelona as well. Uh -huh. It's exciting because they're Catalonia and they're seeking their self-determination. Uh, I mean, I think I have the best subject, right? I mean, yeah. it, it, someone talked about people power and I also teach peace studies, right? Like you have to really suck if you cannot get people excited about human rights. Like you've got great material. So mm -hmm. I, I, hopefully I'm a, a good teacher and uh, can entertain them. Do and you educate use a them. textbook with your peace, class, peace courses? Do you use a I, textbook? Or I you have many books. I, I update every semester because I, too many teachers, you know, we have the old slides and you just talk about what you know. Yeah, right. I pick new books every semester, so. Um, oh, I'll be in back in touch with you. Okay, questions, yeah. Nancy, first on Nancy. Thank you, you were fabulous. We're not done with you. Go ahead, okay. Nancy. Oh, I don't know if I have a question. I just, I'm so thrilled. So my goal before was to um, get our city council to adopt the sustainable development goals. Do you think I should talk about human rights first and ask yeah. them to look at that and, or together? What's your suggestion? Yeah, so I kind of think of the global goals as human rights light. No one's threatened by them, right? They're little cubes and it looks like a Rubik's cube or it's an LGBT puzzle, so it's great. So SDGs are all human rights, uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, right? No poverty, zero hunger, good health, well-being, uh, gender justice, all those. And, and you said you had information for local SDGs. Could I get that from you? Yeah, um, I can even see, let me see, since we're on now, I, I think I can multitask pretty well. I was raised by my mom and my grandma, so women taught me how to do that early on. Uh, let's look. Uh, so you keep talking, and I'm going to find Christina Forrester. Well, that was it, I, but I need to read, because I don't know that I can multitask. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. You know, um, I'm getting some people asking, questions about um, nuclear weapons. How do you feel about that? Not that I know, know your answer, but just go right ahead and talk about the well, nuclear That was exciting this year, right? October 24th was the day that the uh, new treaty got its important signature. Right? Finally. Finally. So that's really good. And then, of course, um, that was one of my first activities. Like, there's so much in life that's been such a rich one, but I won the Martin Luther King Peace Award. Uh, I was the youngest recipient in Hawaii, and it was fun because, oh, my God, I got this award. But France was doing nuclear testing at the time. So um, I gave the award. I had my grandma pick it up for me and let her give a speech, which I figured was perfect because then instead of me, like, worrying about a speech, grandma got to go get some attention, and then she got to give a speech to a whole bunch of people about peace and human rights, and I was able to go down to Tahiti and put pressure on France to uh, no longer do nuclear testing. So. There's a big movement called Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific. I know we both share Oceania and the Pacific, and we, we don't see of it as an impediment, but like Hawaii does and the ancient navigators, you know, it, we, it's a really way to connect us all. And so for the Pacific, unfortunately, you know, the nuclear issue is just that, right? It, it shows how everything's interconnected. And only could we have been so, what do they call them? I, call, I joke around like when they call it silos, right? Those are cylinders of excellence for academics, but they need to be shattered because you would never test a nuclear weapon because you know it could impact everybody else's health. And nature doesn't have borders like they used to colonial powers would draft on a map. So it made no sense. So, you know, I think it's, we just hosted actually the golden rule. I think they're near Santa Barbara. That's where the boat is based in California. And the golden rule was a Quaker ship that was protesting nuclear testing in the 1950s. And they got arrested in Hawaii and never got to the Marshall Islands where it was happening. But just recently, Veterans for Peace uh, came out. And uh, like you said, I, I definitely hopefully make class exciting. So I brought the, the ship 
and the uh, people on the golden rule to come and talk to my class on the first day of class last semester when they first arrived. So um, I think it's all connected. And of course, if you do indigenous rights, that's always where all nuclear tests are done. You know, France doesn't get a nuclear weapon and then explode it on, in the Seine under the Tour de Fel. You know, they always do it where indigenous people live far away. But um, same thing with Australia at Uluru and out in the desert, uh, United States, of course, not far from you, Western Shoshone homeland mm. with the tests there and the nuclear storage. So, you know, it's an indigenous rights issue. It's a humanity issue. And we have way too many weapons still on hair trigger alert. And we just had the biggest twit with a hair trigger alert system in their own mind with their finger on the button. So we know that is not healthy. And we know that no matter who is in, it's not something that we should have as a tool. Uh, it, it's, it's nothing but destruction. And so I think anyone with a indigenous seven generations perspective would show how we have to get rid of those. Exactly. And one of the questions that came in is they want to keep in touch with you. Do okay. you have a website where we could all go and sign up and get the latest from Joshua? I don't know if I, I'm that good. I, I'm usually too busy to do a really good website, but I'm getting better. I don't, better know, I don't dare. Do you dare give? We'll just never share it with anybody but us, but we would love your email. There's my email and here's my phone number. Okay. My goodness. Are you generous? So that's Joshua Cooper Hawaii at Gmail and then 808-542-7204. That's that. Uh-huh. So that's the way that we can keep in touch. And I'm probably cell phone is best. I, I do have people helping me now and working on the website, and I, but I don't tweet enough either. You know, you, you're too busy doing to sometimes do those things. So, um, well, Joshua, uh, you have really inspired us. You know, you are uh, a human being on a mission. And when you're on a mission, don't you feel your energy increases? Oh, yeah. I'm never exhausted. I think I, I sometimes burn out other people, but I'm, uh, I feel so <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, it's been uh, really good on, on, on that front. I'm definitely uh, Well, people say to me, how come I have so much energy? And I can say the same thing to you. How can you have so much energy? And I say it's because I have peace inside. I oh, yeah. know that I can settle down when I need to, but I also <laughs> know that I'm on a mission. And my grandfather was right when he said, I'm going to work for peace. It's the best thing you can do. I had the luxury of being able to work for peace, get on Zoom, tell people how great it is. And you know what I'd like to do, Joshua? At some point, I'd like to have you back, and I want people just to have a conversation with you. At a conversation, because we don't get enough conversations. And so look at Pam. She's going to jump right out of the screen and hug you because she wants that conversation. We're hungry for conversation. And we put you in the middle and we all just start to have a conversation. I want you to meet Judith Harris. She is president of the Pasadena chapter. There's some real important people on here. Um, Catherine in um, Australia is with the Rotary E-Club and we're going to have you speak at the Rotary E-Club too. Do you get around much anymore? Uh -huh. <laughs> I used to like never sleep in my own bed. It was pretty crazy, but now I've been loving it. So uh, I do get around, but I've been really good at saying no to take care of, um, make sure I didn't spread the virus and be positive. So I've, I've been home, like I said, February 27th and 28th was DC, New York. March 1st was Fiji and March 8th was um, Samoa. And then March 9th, we flew to Maui to stop a burial uh, being destroyed there of oh. sacred items. So since March 9th, though, I have been very fortunate in being just at the little Pacific Peace Palace here and not leaving. Well, but, I love it. I love Zoom. I'm a Zoomer now because I don't need to go anywhere. Do you know how much time I have to work on peace? I can work. I just created a peace. I should share and send it to you. Um, you know how the United Nations has that United Nations charter? I just created a peace charter because I think we don't have a peace charter. So I'm going to send that to you now that I have your email. That because sounds great. And if you allow me to share my screen, I'll show Nancy the localized version of the SDG. Share screen. Go right ahead. Okay. You, it says the host disabled participant shared screen. Perfect. Oh, are we, are you at, is Andres here or not? No, but Sharon is. So and as far as Australia goes, the good news oh. is I teach at University of New South Wales. So I'm there at least once or twice a year. And um, we always do a lot of exciting work on Aboriginal rights. So here, 
is the localized version of our SDGs. Oh, look at that. So what we did is we, um, is all the little people, it's the same color and same numbers, but so everyone has a lay on for no poverty. Uh-huh. Zero hunger, we got a food basket, right? Uh-huh. Uh, good health and well-being. We have Diamond Head, Leahi, which I can see from my bed. That's a little extinct volcano, the tourist attraction with the shaka. Quality education. We've got a book in the lap of the mom with the baby, but also the stars. Gender equality. We have sharing kava, men and women serving each other. Clean water. We got a nice little water catchment system. Seven. We got the wind power and wave and solar. And eight. We have that fair trade logo we've sort of improved. Nine for infrastructure. Oh my goodness, I tell you, I grew up in Waianae, so I rode the bus my whole life for, that's how I got good grades, a lot of time to read. So that's our, the bus, public transportation. 10 is Queen Lilio Kalani. She was an amazing advocate, uh, the last monarch in Hawaii. 11, sustainable cities and communities. We put our city, uh, our Hawaii State Legislature there, but we also put the highest business building to do public-private partnership. We put Aloha Tower. 12 is a tea leaf lay, and we make those with our toes, and we put the tea leaves and then weave it. We thought that was a cool one for responsible consumption. 13 is climate action with our islands. 14 is life below water. Their fish is so lame that the UN did. Bless them. But, you know, it looks like a goldfish, so we did it the does. humu. It doesn't even look real. Yeah, ours is the humu humu nuku nuku a pua'a. And then we got some coral. And then 15 was the Mauna Kea logo. It's a cool indigenous sign. 16, like you like, is peace with the little lay around the wrist. And 17 is taro or kalo. And then, of course, we put our islands in the middle. And then Aww. let me see. I think we have the indigenous one below. I'll share that. Here it's you go. Wonderful job. So with our indigenous one, it's not the same logos. So we took that bird, remember, for women's rights for number five, Beijing. Mm -hmm. It's the dove. We turned it into the nene goose. <laughs> uh, we have Maui, the god that everybody loved from uh, the film Moana. He's number seven because he caught the sun with his um, amazing uh, hook. Uh, we've got Malama Honua, that canoe from Hawaii, the hokulea that went around the world, voyaging only using the stars. Uh, so we just made it local. We have Iolani Palace, which was the, the seat of the Hawaiian government. Uh, Kalakawa, they had electricity before the White House. So that's cool. And we have surfing for number three, and then we have it all in Hawaiian language. So, you know, that was just us trying our best to contribute to the global conversation. I love it that it's in Hawaiian. Um, I was afraid that you guys were going to lose your language because they're, everybody's speaking English in Hawaii now. So the fact that you put them in your language is really important. And that's, it's, it's keeping it alive, you know, and I think that's one of the important aspects. Also, indigenous wisdom is in that language, and it also mm -hmm. teaches us new ways to see the world. Well, I hope they're teaching Hawaiian in the schools there, are they? Not as good as we should, and we're not doing human rights education either, so we still have a little bit more work to do before we retire. Well, I think you just have to go to every single classroom and just tell them, come on now, let's all get back uh -huh. to our language, speak it at home. Jack, do you have a question? I see you're ready. Yeah, Yeah, sure do. Hey, Joshua, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. When you teach your um, courses in human, in uh, peace studies and a lot of your um, human rights um, activism, how do you take into account the growing negative influence of um, social media, the conspiracy theories, often are promoting things that are antithetical um, to what the human rights are, you know, hatred, bigotry, attacking views that um, are different than yours, et cetera, et cetera. Good question, Jack. That's a great question. And I haven't had to deal with it enough to really play through it. And I think the only way you'll know is, is as you approach it. So um, I used to, t I used, I've taught 50 different courses at the University of Hawaii, like all the different ones and over a hundred different uh, classes over the time. One of them I love teaching was presidential politics, but I was really glad they didn't ask me to teach it during this last <laughs> administration, uh, the, the former administration because it, it just would have been so hard because it was all just so personal and so full of betrayal and hate. And so um, the closest example I have, well, first and foremost, I try to be really chill and cool when I'm talking about stuff. And I, 
you know, the one thing is we have to realize it's not new though, right? I mean, the U.S. didn't join the League of Nations. So we've always had the Republican Party being really isolationist street. So it's nothing new. Uh, the walking out of Paris, it's, it's the Heritage Foundation, it's those think tanks. And so I think we as UNA have to really challenge that by pointing out why it's valid and why it's, it's important for all of us. So I try not to come in too hard and heavy. In fact, when I teach, I don't always talk or say what I believe. It's really, I try to make sure they talk more. Um, probably the best challenge I just had recently, and I don't know if I did well with it because I was just, I couldn't believe she said it. It was a smart woman who was really been good in class. And she said, well, you know, we're not sure if the election, there's too much fraud in it. And I was like, you know, so I took the deepest breath because I didn't want to attack her, you know, and it was just a couple of weeks ago. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, um, could you just maybe share? Because that's what we've always done with our class, your source on that. Like, could you give examples of what fraud has taken place and where? Because, you know, as we have our discussions, it's important that we can verify and validate and be able to say where it's coming from, you know? And so, I mean, I, I, I go, I don't want to disagree with you, but I don't believe what you're saying. I haven't heard it yet. So could you show it with to me and we could all explore it as a class together and then get to it next week. If there's something I don't, that we just all aren't aware of, can you please just share the source? And then that allows us to better understand. And so sure enough, there was no proof and there was none of those things, but then I did my best the next week in class going, you know, hey, I just want to say, you know, as we, I always start with current events. So that's a, yeah. that's, that's a doozy. But um, the good news was, you know, most students can read through it. Um, another example I had, another one, Jack, that was before that was um, waterboarding. Yeah. So um, I was teaching class and we started with current events. And uh, I'll just make it a quick story. But the funniest thing was the first student said, you know, it's, it's horrible and it's bad, but that was my student that goes to Starbucks and he wears all black and, you know, he reads all the right things. So he's like, waterboarding, it's evil. It's so inhumane. And no one's convinced by his argument because that's what he always says. You know, that's just who he is. He's the guy in black who has Starbucks and, you know, you know, it's just a cool kid and right. his humanity. Right. The second person was just a kid in the back who just watches box and just, just spewed exactly what he heard. Just a parrot, you know, well, it's not waterboarding and what happens if they come for your grandmother and da, 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 you know, straight away. And, you know, I'm like, oh, my goodness, because that's one of the things you have to do as a teacher, sort of moderate, but you can't just force your, your will. If you force it, I think they'll, they'll reject it even more. So you have to get them to come to that point by themselves. It sort of takes a little bit of work. And but the last student was perfect. The last student was like, I'm in the military and uh, I served overseas. And when I was in basic, my colleagues waterboarded me one night and I still thought I was going to die. Even though they were my friends and I knew who they were, you just can't breathe so much that you think you're dying and it's torture. Let me tell you, it's torture. And it was the best thing. I didn't have to go into Amnesty International and right. law. That student said it all. So I try my best to be a facilitator when I'm teaching. And I know it's going to get worse. You know, I know I'm going to have a nightmare day where I'll, I haven't had to come to it. I remember when I was in college, all my teachers always talked how they drank when they graded papers to get through it. And I, the good news is I know with COVID either you're supposed to become a drunk, a chunk, a hunk, or a monk. And I'm hopefully going more <laughs> towards the monk and hunk stuff. <laughs> but I, I haven't had any That's more. That's funny. I don't drink you have another question? I, before. I see your hand up there. Jack, Thank you. Know. Another question? They have to do it. Oh, is, you're so great. You know, it's so interesting. It for I wrote the book called Revolutionary Conversations because when Robert was at the United Nations, we would see all these disagreements and we would say, well, how come they're in disagreement? They are here for peace. And if we can't figure out something that you have in common, and that's the first step, just what you did, you stop and you listen and you ask, well, what, does, what can you tell me more? And that's the first step. So I'll send you my book too one of these days. Oh, all right. So anyway, we're at the end of our hour. This has been an incredible information downloading. We are downloaded. We are now DNA, Joshua. We love you, Joshua. Joshua, do you have a dream for our planet? Uh, Barbara, uh, Catherine has a question. Her hand is up. You're I see Catherine. Thank you, Gail. Before we Arthur. go, Catherine. So how about I won't say anything, and my dream will be answering Catherine and Arthur before we're done. Okay, Catherine, please. <laughs> 
Thank you. Joshua, I really like that localizing of the SDG, um, you know, picture, whatever. Um, with your connection with Australian Indigenous, is there any way we can work uh, to get it localized in Indigenous language here? Oh, absolutely. It looks like you're near, I'm um, not sure. It's Queensland, I think. I'm is in it? Queensland. Okay. Um, I was, I have really good friends in Maroubra Bay and it looks just like the one behind you, uh, right outside of Sydney. But um, no, we could definitely partner. Uh, Australia's UPR is coming up in January and I'm actually working with your National Human Rights Institution down on Pitt Street. And uh, we're coordinating and I'm sharing all my email addresses from the missions in Geneva that they don't have them yet. And so no, it'd be great to partner. And I always try to work with UNA um, New Zealand, I mean, UNA Australia, but I think they're based in either Melbourne. I think they're in Melbourne. I'm not sure. Well, there's, there's one I was a member of in New South Wales, Sydney. Um, and Sydney's not so far away, and now we've opened our borders, I can get down there fairly quickly. Perfect. So we could definitely do a UNA Australia, UNA Hawaii US event together for sure. We could even probably do a UPR event before or after it happens on how to implement recommendations. But definitely on the SDGs, um, you have so many languages too, you know. I mean, most of my friends are Gabi Gabi uh, people. Uh, but I'm sure with the revitalization of language and the culture coming back in Australia, Tasmania is doing really cool things, just to give you that link. Tasmania, we just did a voluntary local review event with them. And they're great because like apple, all their ciders, everybody's drinking and a little too tipsy probably. They're just they're celebrating Article 24, right to rest and leisure. Uh, so, but they're doing it sustainably. It's all local cider. Uh, so, you know, I think we could definitely partner and you could WhatsApp me or email me and it'd be great to uh, do UNA together. That's great. And that would be exciting. We need to have you do something with all the UNAs at one time because it would really motivate them. Gail, I don't have um, gallery viewed. Is there anybody else that has a question? Arthur, Gail? I think out of one polite finger up. Arthur, I can't see, I'm on speak review. Yes, uh, wow, okay. your students Arthur. are so lucky to have such a very special teacher as you. Uh, they, really, they really are. And I wonder if, if you've shown your film, the shown your students the movie that I made that Barbara is in uh, called The World is My Country, the hidden history of the people power movement behind the, uh, univer uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights getting passed unanimously. And in the movie, Barbara says that Gary inspired not only her husband, but the leaders who created the European Union and they, they can do something grander today. Are you already using that with your students or familiar? Maybe you should send him your link. I, I would love to because I know it's available sometimes and I watched it once during one of the screenings Good. of I think the World Federalist. Did you show it through World uh -huh. Federalist? He did. Okay, so I saw it through right. that. I, I heard about it, uh, but I don't have the DVD and I don't have the link to be able to show it often, but I, I have every week I just concluded it with um, a couple of schools. We did a global human rights and fundamental freedoms film festival every Friday. And I would love to show it sometime in the spring because I, I think people love watching movies more than they love reading these days, unfortunately. So what I tried to do is we created a calendar of consciousness, courage, creativity, and compassion. And it's all the dates in history that matter. And then we also have good quotes. But then I also put at the bottom movies that matter and uh, music that moves you. So I'd love to include it on one of those examples if you share that with me, Arthur, that'd be great. Yes, I will, I'll copy the chat. And I'll also send you the link to, uh, since you also mentioned the nuclear issue, a movie I created way back with Paul Newman when he was alive called War Without Winners that's also important on the nuclear issue. So I'll send you both links. And uh, I'll, I think I'll get your email right out of the chat. I was fortunate <laughs> to work of course, with UNA when they had the Leo Nevis Task Force, who I think was Paul Newman's attorney that helped set that up. And uh, that's exciting. No, and I love your sticker in the back. I love the earth and the art. That's for sure. Well, thank you, Joshua. <laughs> Joshua, you have your dream and you probably have shared it in different ways today. But if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing on the planet, what would that be? Or just a dream, either way. Well, I think... First and foremost, it would probably be, uh, we'd have to tackle the climate crisis. 
and then definitely uh, love for all. I think if, if love is in your heart and it motivates you, then it definitely shows the way and provides more than enough. And uh, that, yeah, that's uh, important. And of course, I think, you know, I think we have to dream and do. So I think most of you on here are doing enough and then uh, we don't get enough time to dream because we don't sleep enough, but uh, we'll do that as well. Dream and do. My late husband said, if you don't dream it, it won't happen. Dream. And then you watch the universe support you. The coincidences that happen. Like Nancy took on this class with you. And she said, Barbara, we have to have Joshua. And I said, all right, let's have Joshua. I didn't know that you were so hot. But now we're all excited about you. All right, Joshua, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else want to thank him? I'll unmute you all. Just thank Joshua. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank you, Joshua. Thank you, thank you, thank you so Joshua. This was wonderful. Oh, very inspiring you are just something else all right my friends i'm going to record this and i'll send you all the recording and it'll be on our unasb.org you. joshua god bless you and keep up the energy and the good work all right okay. well, you give us energy, energy to go yeah. with join the chat with the ford roosevelt next if you got that link from the chat uh, yeah ford that's roosevelt. coming in um that's you, santa that. barbara's i uh, sorry san diego's right walter i don't mean walter arthur right. yeah you and it, right yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Barbara. Happy Human Rights Day. Happy Human Rights Day. Bye. Yeah.